present good day everyone my name is justin scott from 876 here again with a very special interview today we have the man the myth the legend mr jeffrey hall right one of the main movers behind the jamaica producers group he is also a director on several boards such as blue power the scotia group uh lumber depot and we're going to have a great discussion with him today discussing where he's been how he became the man he is today, the moves that he's been currently making, and where he's going from here. All right, so without further ado, Jeffrey, how are you doing today? I'm good, Justin. Good to be here. That's excellent. That's excellent. So um, let's just start from the start, right? So in doing some research of mine, uh, I was going through your background. You're, you're a campanite, of course, right? And I found out that, you know, between leaving Campion and starting out in Washington University, you did a brief year in, in, in a brief stint in Venezuela. Could you expand on that? What was going on there? I, I was an exchange student, Justin, okay. and I lived in a very small town near the Maracaibo Lake. About 3,000 people in the town. It was a, kind of a cattle rearing town. Uh, at the time, Venezuela was the richest country in yeah. Latin America. That's that oil money. Um, it's had a kind of a fall from grace since then. And it was interesting, at least the level of its, of its GDP. And it was interesting to kind of be in that environment and to compare it with life in Kingston. So I learned Spanish and I hung out in the countryside for a year. Okay, okay. And you found that um that, that kind of experience there, so learning Spanish being in a brand new different environment was was beneficial to you like going forward. So, well, you know, I was 17, 18, last year of high school. Okay. So I did all the things that you'd expect me to do in the last year of high school. <laughs> and at the same time gained a tremendous comfort with Latin America, with Latin culture. And that's translated into some of the things that I've done commercially over the years. And, um, you know, you know the language, you know the people, makes business easier. So, okay, okay. More that way. All right. Have you been back since? Any plans for doing business over there? Or, or is there external factors that might be preventing that? We don't do business with, with Venezuela. Yeah. Um, and I haven't been back. But I have a love of the people the culture okay. uh, we do business in quite a few latin american countries and have done so over the years okay. not venezuela <laughs> all right venezuela that's chosen a very different path and it it's probably hasn't presented opportunities right now mm. okay that's fair that's fair and then um but yeah so moving on to that from venezuela to washington university you know uh, you 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 had your your background in econ, right? You graduated summa cum laude. Uh, yeah, yeah, I love economics. It's a discipline. It's a way of thinking. You know, I, I did economics at WashU, which is what we call Washington University, and uh, really fell in love with a branch of economics called institutional economics, which really is about how how institutions are organized and and how they work and why they work. Um, but also general micro and macro definitely influenced the way I read the papers and look at the world and went on from there to do public policy and law. And I would say both of those things also are filters through which I you know, interpret what's going on around the world. background. Because to me, that's a, that's a very stark um, jump off, you know, from being in econ, jumping out into law. Right. Well, there's a branch of, of law called Law and Economics, mm -hmm. which, you know, asks what kind of rules um, optimize economic outcomes. And that's essentially what I do every day of the week, you know, cut deals, <laughs> you know, yeah, and, and do it with a perspective on the rules of the game and, you know, what you owe me, what I owe you, and also how we're going to optimize it economically. So it's, I, I would say that combination has informed what I've done ever since school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Right. Because um, to me, that's a bit, it was like a, a straight stretch of, okay, so from Campion to Venezuela to um, Washington University and then, you know, Harvard. So there was a lot of schooling at first to really inform a decision. So how did you know that you wanted to be, you know, in, into business directly that you say, okay, cool, I have the background now, but this is where I made my pace? Yeah, I, I wasn't always a, a, a good student. I wasn't a particularly good student at Campion, and I wasn't a particularly good student in Venezuela. I definitely was more focused on having a good time and uh, getting to. Yeah, <laughs> I can relate with that, man. It takes a little while to settle down, but you know, once you start to find something that you're definitely interested in or that challenges you, yeah, right, that's that's where you really find interest, man. Well, I like A level economics, even at, even so, even in the early days, I found that to be compelling and that was probably the only subject I did any decent work in. <laughs> I feel that. And and, was, um, yeah, so, so push really hard academically after that for all the reasons you mentioned, you know, it was what I enjoyed doing. And so, yeah, I finished at um, Wash U and went on to Harvard and Harvard Law. And then I went into what's a fairly conventional thing for uh, Harvard Law graduate, which is a Wall Street type law firm, very right. old, big, prestigious law firm, I guess. And they had, you know, they were kind of a firm that would have been incorporated, you know, General Electric, and would okay. have been, you know, principal outside counsel to old, old line Wall Street firms like J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley and people like that. So it was a very um, formal institutional setting, but very, very grounded and very focused on operating at a very high level. I had a lot of fun. I really loved it. Um, and decided to come back to Jamaica for a year as a kind of a, a, a sabbatical, something I really wanted to do just for the fun of it, uh, even though it was a tough is issue, uh, which was to, to go back to Jamaica to work on FinSec. Yes. At the time, you had this massive collapse of maybe more than 50% of the financial sector. So the businesses that you now know as NCB and Sagicor and Guardian would have all, uh, and they would have been different businesses at the time owned by different people and having different names. I don't want to say anything negative about those institutions as they are now, but, but just to give people who are, are listening to this a sense of the dimension of this thing. All of these businesses were underwater at that time. Yeah. And it was a you know kind of a giant workout, and I just thought for somebody who cares about doing deals uh, and cares about Jamaica, that that was a great place to, to to be. And under underlying that, by the way, so not just the institution, but even within the loan books of institutions, you'd have had big financial workout issues. So the big commercial loans within those banks would have themselves been underwater. And so you're kind of at the center of this thing as a 28 year old and it was a great place to start. Yeah, man, I can imagine because like seeing the situation as it was then, especially at such a young age and decided like, okay, this is where I want to be right now. I want to take charge of this. I want to make a name for myself essentially. And you were an intervention specialist, right? What, what, what exactly, what kind of role was that directly? Yeah, I don't know why they gave me that title. It doesn't really mean <laughs> And um, my job was just to do whatever my boss wanted me to do. And my boss at the time was Patrick Hilton, who currently runs uh, NCB Financial Bureau. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, he didn't recruit me back. I was originally recruited back by, by Omar Davies and the then chairman of FinSec, a guy named Gladstone Bonick, who was a World Bank um, economic expert. So they brought him in. He eventually brought in Patrick. And... Um, so my job was intervention specialist, and essentially we, we, we had to kind of cajole the owners of these financial institutions to hand over the shares in them so that the government could then put capital in to prop them up and bail them out. And at the time, these would have been the biggest transactions in the history of the country, probably the Caribbean, English-speaking Caribbean. Mm. And then the day after we kind of took control of them, we had to get in there and figure out, you know, what was on the balance sheet and and optimize that and so 
I'd start memories of grown men, big businessmen in Jamaica coming into my office and literally breaking down in tears because they lost everything, either at the level of the, the financial institutions or at the level of the loan book. And so it was very, I like an interesting time, really very agile. And I reported directly to Patrick and, and we um, both feet. We had to issue a lot of a debt. I imagine, yeah. Unfortunately, rapidly. And so we had to craft um, what became what were called FinSAC notes, which were essentially IOUs from FinSAC, uh, which were used to put some substance into the balance sheet of the institution, but ultimately became government to make a debt. And unfortunately, we took a long time to pay, to pay it back, even though uh, as a result, we have a, a pretty healthy financial sector today. Right. So it was it was in the long run it's essentially worked out rather than letting all of these businesses go under. Um even though some of them may not have well not may not even be here today, a good amount of them, as a matter of fact. Uh Siban is one of the remnants that comes to mind. <laughs> yeah. Right. But is there any particular company that stood out most to you that um that you really enjoyed working on or or that's just really memorable to you? Well, we, we had to, to, to there are a lot of little names that, that today you, you may have forgotten about. Island Victoria Bank, um, Crown Eagle Life Insurance Company, yeah. Eagle Merchant Bank, you know, names that you probably don't even know, I'm not sure. Um, but they, essentially we had to roll them up into what you now see as, as, as large, stable financial institutions. And they all had very different IT systems. They had different management teams. And we essentially had to go in there and set the tone and put them together. Um, right. And I think my, my, my most memorable experiences would have been kind of doing the transactions to get the government's control position. Okay. You know, the, the workouts after the fact. Uh, we're a long, hard slot. Um, okay. All right. Very cool. And yeah. then following after that, though, I, I understand you, you you went into private private equity with Caribbean Equity Partners. So, because I, I believe you were in that FinSAC for like a year and change. Um, how do you make the transition there? And uh, who are the people that you were directly dealing with? Well, remember, I went to FinSAC because of and a love of government, love of country, and really wanted to do something in public policy as a brief stint, and then mm -hmm. go on back to New York. And um, and the law firm was expecting me back. But at the time, I ended up meeting other people who had very similar interests, kind of a, a perspective on finance and business, but also um, an interest in public policy and government. And at the time, we, we, we thought, look, let's see if we can create an investment platform for the Caribbean. Right. And there was this concession that all the Caribbean governments had signed up to, to create a venture fund that would be tax-free and would allow for tax-free investment in all the Caribbean islands. And it was on the books as a concept that was supposed to lead to development, but nobody was going to do anything about it. And so we, we came together as a bunch of people who cared about investment and cared about business, but also cared about um, our community and, and the Caribbean to try to get this thing off the ground. And we really succeeded. So we were all about 28 the owners of the business. Um, and we joint ventured with ICWI. Um, okay. And essentially said about raising private equity funds in an era in the Caribbean in which people weren't doing that. And as you know, interest rates were all so high and we were coming out of a financial sector meltdown. So it wasn't kind of a, an obvious macro play. It was kind yeah. of counterintuitive, but we actually raised about $32 million um, of committed capital, yeah. primarily from multilaterals who, who saw the vision. And uh, my partners uh, are people that you, that you probably know now um, 
because they've, they've shifted in in and out of the public sector. But um, Nigel Clark, who's our Minister of Finance, was a partner, and David Panton, who was a senator um, in the JLP some time back, and um, Ted Cruz, who is in U.S. politics. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's so interesting, man. So... I'm the only person that, in that group that didn't, didn't have a, a political I ambition. They <laughs> didn't have a political attitude. So. Okay. That's probably what I'm doing. <laughs> That's fair. So I want to even paint a contrast between private equity in Jamaica then when we're doing that and private equity now. Is there a, what, what's, your, what's your view on the current space? I say it's a lot more, a lot more opportunity at the level of raising money now. Um, so in those days it was tough to raise money and certainly you couldn't raise money easily from domestic capital. We had to get a lot of international capital. And we had to get a lot of multilateral capital, which comes with very strict rules about what you can invest in. They, they want to buy us towards development. They want to buy us towards venture. They want to buy us towards small business, which doesn't necessarily always line up with where the best financial opportunities are because their their mandate is development. Yeah. So, so, but at the time, I would say you could have bought assets for a very good value. Now it's kind of the other way around, which is, of course, market principles. Now it's not so hard to raise money. You know, pension funds and financial institutions and the markets are looking for things to, to put money in. And if you have a good story and good people involved and integrity and so on, you can raise money. But asset values are relatively high priced compared yeah. to what they used to be. And um, now even then, although the values would have been good, you'd be taking a lot of risk because you couldn't you couldn't put a lot of debt on the on the companies you buy. Whereas now you can, you can. So you can. There's always good opportunity. Is the way I see it. Uh, it's just a question of the, the game you choose, how you choose to, to tackle it. All right. Yeah, because I know back then the interest rates would have been much, well, certainly much higher than they were like today, even with the more recent increases that the BOJ has has, has put on though. So I can see why. Um, they might be a bit more reluctant to be investing directly into um into something that seems a bit more risky and unsure, right? Well, now whereas now we're a bit more liberal in a sense with um with the assets that we're investing in. Interest rates are very high, and and um, you know it's very hard to justify a return on equity. You know the, the equity capital component of your investment that will equal the cost of debt. So the cost mm. of debt in those days would be north of 18 percent. Oh, wow. you know, and so and so you whatever you're doing, you had to have a return on investment. It was higher than that. So you would have been if you'd have been wise, you'd be investing for the long term. But people got people took a long term view and jumped in. And it's one of the interesting stories about the way the Caribbean works because. At the time, a lot of capital from outside of Jamaica was feeling more confident about the opportunities here. So the Trinidadians and the Barbadians would have come in hard in in both the financial sector and the non-financial sector. And outside of kind of those on the ground services businesses, obviously a lot of Spanish capital came into the tourism mm -hmm. business and telecoms investments also were quite significant. And came in, and those investments for a good time thereafter paid off very handsomely. A lot of Jamaican capital lost confidence, was on the sidelines. Now, now you're seeing a, a kind of another story where things are strong your own. is going back. So, if you look at the the story of of Guardian, you know, Guardian at the time, the so Guardian Life in Trinidad at the time, start prior to the FinSAC era, was owned by. The, the larger shareholder was Mutual Life, which was an old Jamaican company where one of the founding shareholders was George William Gordon. So that gives you a sense of its, of its wow. history. And it would have been, in that era, the largest life insurance book in Jamaica. So this is in the 90s, early 90s. And they would have owned Garden in Trinidad. And then when the hard times in Jamaica started to hit, they had to exit that asset. And then, you know, you kind of fast forward so the, in the worst moments of FinSAC, you'd have had RBTT, which is a, a Trinidadian bank, uh, 
piling into Jamaica um, and acquiring the banking assets of a whole series of banks I won't even bother to, to, to name for you now. But they would have come back in, and of course, Sajiko is a Barbadian company, they would have come, come into the market at the time. And um, ultimately, the same Guardian Life came back in and, 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 and bought a Jamaican life insurance book. Mm. And then now, uh, you know who owns Guardian today. And so it's, it's been this cycle of, of understanding where in the Caribbean the opportunity is. The development. Now, now there's, some, there's some steady players, right, who have been here all along and, and kept doing what they've done, what they've been doing very successfully over a very long period of time. And obviously, I have an association with one of those which we can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, yeah, man, it, I, fi I find it very interesting how things, how the cycles work, you know, because then you had a lot of um, foreign capital, as you said, coming into Jamaica, like basically buying out and, and taking pieces of, of what is here. But then now, a lot of these Jamaican companies are taking stake in, in other companies and, and assets further out into the Caribbean. For example, Proven just recently went out, um, Roberts Manufacturing out in Barbados, V-Mill just bought uh, a stake of, of, of RFI. I can link that in the show notes for you guys in the, in the description and link that later. But, and you know, there's, there's just generally a lot of further acquisitions. You, um, you know, you, you want Norbic Equity inked out a deal to acquire a water company out in Dominican Republic. And so it's a very interesting turnover. You know, the tables have really shifted around. Yeah, you, I mean, I think it's important for people to understand that dynamic and to know where we are in that cycle, you know. And once you define yourself as not necessarily being limited by your community or by Jamaica or by the Caribbean or by the Caribbean and Latin America, or, then it really comes to the question of where do you want to place capital, you know, within your sphere of competence globally. And JP is very fortunate in that we've definitely taken the view that we can deploy capital um, in a wide range of places. And Jamaica actually is not a bad source of capital right now. We have a kind of a psychology that says that um, it's a hard place to source capital because for 30 years it really, really was. Mm. But right now, it, you, if you're able to borrow, there's a negative real interest rate. So what that means is that if you look at inflation expectations, which the last announced number was kind of north of 7%, right, yeah. you can borrow if you're organized at lower than that. So in theory, you can borrow at, say, 6% and buy an asset, like a house, that in theory would be worth 7.5%. 4% more at the end of a year, you only owe 6% more to the bank. Okay. And so you're able to source capital domestically to do, to do powerful things. And obviously, if you free up capital within your domestic business, you can deploy it in markets that are, are high growth. And the Dominican Republic, a really interesting story, apart from the population base being the largest, uh, and excluding Cuba for, for various reasons, just because it's much more complicated to invest there. But being the largest in the Caribbean, for the last 25 years, it had a, a kind of an average annual growth rate of north of 6%. Really? Yeah. And so it's just been a powerful transformation. If you've been, if you put capital there over the long term, I mean, Santo Domingo is a city with a, a subway system. And, you know, it, it's, and it wasn't always that way. And you can literally see the transformation taking place. Um, but, but that said, it's not a place where you have a vibrant public equity market like you do in Jamaica, you know, so we have some things that we can show them too. And that's what's bringing us together. Now that mutual benefit of arm um, of the, of, of opportunity. Yeah. So we see a big consumer market there. Uh, and it's a consumer market that uses some of the same skill sets that have been owned in Jamaica, um, that we believe we can, we can tap into. That's great. But what's your view on, especially not, not only just Jamaica, but like the wider Caribbean region? Because as it is right now, we're having, we're having as a matter of fact, um, even at the question preloaded, 
we have the issue of inflation largely which is imported as a result of um say even the global shipping chain issues that we have um right around the world we have reduced amount of labor and out, or output and productivity and a lot of that is is causing the um, the inflation that we're seeing right now is and and the way how the caribbean is set up we're importing a lot of it which is causing you know increases down here locally and across the caribbean right so you're asking you know what's yeah, what, what causes the inflation and what's my outlook right yeah so so i think you're right that the root cause is linked to some extent uh, to COVID. Although even immediately prior to COVID, the there were labor shortages in parts of the world, and there was also a big push for for wage increases. You know, the fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage push has been on for a bit of time in the U.S. and certainly in parts of Europe. You know, they've been close to full employment, and so there have been some wage push even pre-COVID. But definitely the supply chain challenges around COVID were hugely impactful. Um, and that's related to global shipping, um, as well as some production and the ways that global ports work. But if you look at the global shipping lines, you know they are making a lot more money. And so some of that is profits that if the market is competitive, will unwind and the supply chain Disruptions ought to to find their way um, to resolution sometime in the second half of next year. But we definitely piled in. I mean, so we we bought a shipping line in April. Yes. And our shipping line has five ships that go from Rotterdam in the Netherlands to Portsmouth, England, on down to the Eastern mm -hmm. Caribbean, right. in Colombia, Domrep. So we're really trying to do something with Domrep there, and then back up to Europe. And they bring consumer goods west and primarily do fresh fruit exports going mm. back east. And it's been a, a very good investment, very timely. But what I've observed in that investment, and I, it's true for other shipping lines, is that there's some very fixed items that are part of the PL of the business that are not likely to move rapidly. So we have to book ships uh, for long term long term contracts. And so we're going to have to essentially lease a ship for a period of years at a rate that's fixed even in this environment. And in addition to that, for the big volumes of things that we move, those folks are not going to kind of take a spot market price and see what happens. So they book big volumes for the full for at least a full year. So a big a big part of our ship, the majority of it is already well, hopefully by the end of the year, we'll be fixed contracts with, with commercial movers of cargo. And once they fix those contracts, they're going to have to uh, address their prices to the consumer market. So it's going to be unlikely it's going to all unwind uh, in three or four or five months. A lot of that's going to have to run through annual cycle of fixed contracts. And so, so you, my, my view is that they'll come down a little bit, freight rates, um, towards the back end of the year, but definitely won't go back to where they were at the outset. All right. So, but, but like, even regarding the um the acquisition of 50% of in geese, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So how far back did you really see or anticipate the um the supply chain or the shipping issues, man? Because that was your, um, the, the acquisition announced in about the early half of 2021. So how far back did you really see and anticipate the way our things were going? But, you know, I've been watching Geese for a long time, you know, for years. I've wanted that business. And almost all the businesses that you see JP buy, I've wanted them for a long time. And it really is a question of, of being opportunistic. And so yeah, it's a good crisis. I, I would, Geese is based in England. And whenever I go to England, I call the guys who run it and say, listen, let's go have a cup of coffee and, you know, and try and listen to what they're doing. And, try to understand the, the ships that they operated and where they got them from and get to know the people who own them and that kind of thing. Because our joint venture partner is a, is a ship owning business. So I, I kind of knew I wanted to, to get that asset. And the reason I wanted to get it is a big part of its, its westbound business is, is commercial cargo going to Barbados, Antigua, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, etc., Dominica, Grenada, you name it. 
and and obviously going east is bananas. And I feel like I know something about both of those businesses, probably better than anybody else who's going to be able to pay for it. You know, and therefore, if it's ever for sale, we ought to be be in the runnings. And then their shareholder was COVID affected. I went uh, up in in maybe September of last year. Right. And so obviously you saw the opportunity and ran with it. We ran with it. <laughs> we were just being opportunistic there. Yeah. Love that. I love I, I wouldn't say it was a, a call about the logistics environment, even though it's tough to do a deal in COVID, you know, because you don't get to go visit the, the team and kick the tires. So because I've been watching it all that time, we could do a deal over Zoom and and, and get it done. So we didn't actually visit the offices of the business until we had bought and paid for it. Okay. And then afterwards, it's just a matter of um, running over everything, I know details, right? I mean, how do we do it? How do we run it? Uh, yeah. No, well, we have a we have a good long-standing CEO and CFO in England, but a team of about 30 people that are do the admin. I mean, obviously on the on the vessels and the ports are there are other people, but but I've known the, the key people there for a few years, made an effort to get to know them. So okay. we put in place a governance structure around them, um, you know, and that works.